Will you bow your heads with me as we look to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just want to humbly say thank you for allowing us to come into your house this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. And we ask, God, that your spirit would sweetly speak to the hearts of people who are here. God, we have heard your word. Help us to be faithful to live out what we've just heard. Because, God, you want us to be individuals who stand up for the weak. Heavenly Father, may we respond in a way that gives you honor and glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. And this is, this is pretty serious stuff. What if I told you, what if I told you that there are people who are suffering almost every single hour of every single day that there are people who are suffering, that there are people who do not have the ability to alleviate hunger or pain or discouragement. Most of the time when we think of suffering, almost automatically within our culture, we go think of a third world country. We, we automatically, if I said the word suffering, undue pain, unnecessary suffering, most of you would probably already drift away and think about the people who are suffering from Ebola in West Africa. 4,000 people have passed out into eternity all because of a disease. But ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I want you to know that even in our own backyard right here, there are people who are suffering. You do not need to look at a third world country to see that people are suffering and that God calls us as followers of his son, Jesus Christ, God calls us to help to stand up for the weak. Did you know currently right now, and this is in our own backyard, this is, I'm not talking about a third world country. I'm not talking about somewhere remote, way down in the swamps of Louisiana. I'm talking right here in our own backyard. One in six go to bed hungry. That's pretty shocking when you think about the United States. What about this? The average age, currently right now, the average age for sex trafficking is between 13 and 14 years old. I, I don't know about you, but I wasn't all that old. Um, 13, you, you're, you're just barely figuring out how to use a calculator and you just barely got your training wheels off your, your bicycle at the age of 13 and 14. There are people that you pass every single day. There are individuals that you pass that God deliberately puts them in your way because you have the power to help release them from suffering or injustice. And so... This morning, I, I want to speak on three specific areas in which that God calls us, his people, to live a life that is far more than just being consumed about our own self-interests. And when you think about a, a life of sacrifice and a life of commitment, right in our, in our own area we have a college named after an individual by the name of William Wilberforce raise your hand if you've ever heard of William Wilberforce it's a college he was so convicted over one day reading God's word he was so convicted that at great risk to himself and to his political position he started to be an individual who stood up for the rights of black people. It took a lot of criticism, took a lot of, a lot of heat for it because he spoke in the British Parliament and tried to release the black people from slavery. And it was over 20 years. But finally, he saw it take place. He saw people being liberated. And that brings us to point number one. Point number one is be a voice for good. God calls us, his body, the New Testament church, to be a voice, to be a voice that is for good. 
Here's what the New Testament church is known for today. The church of today typically is known as a voice of complaining. Instead of being a voice for good, let me tell you something. I have never seen people in my whole entire life know how to complain like church people. Can I get an amen? I'm, I'm being serious. Folks need to say amen or ouch, one of the two. Either I preach too long, I preach too short. I shout too much, I don't shout enough. Say amen. That's just the way it is. You have a chicken dinner, it's not crispy enough or it's too soft and soggy. It's, it, or it's not like Mamaw made. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Mashed potatoes are too lumpy or the mashed potatoes are too creamy. You can't please everybody. Shut up and grab a bowl of mashed potatoes and just go on to town. That's what you need to do. I've never seen, I've never seen the life in, in my whole born days. You see, when we become self-centered, we complain because things don't please us. You will never be a voice for the weak. You'll never be the voice for the suffering. If you're only concerned, you are totally consumed about the person that you see in the mirror each and every day. God calls us into a life of service and self-sacrifice to help build others and to help point others to the cross of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, not only is the church known for complaining, but the church is also known for condemning. I want, us, I want us to get this in our mind. I want us to wrap around that in our spiritual mind that Christ did not come to condemn. Jesus said in John chapter 3, he says in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son to condemn the world but that the world through him might have eternal life. Unfortunately, when you think of the word church, most people between the ages of 18 and 35, based on the book Unchristian, unfortunately, they lump us all together with Westboro Baptist Church. You ever hear of them? Yeah. A church that's full of hate and condemnation. So instead of being a voice for good, we're known for that. We're also known as being a people who have a voice for political leverage. Now, I'm, I'm not ashamed of who I vote for, and I don't think I've got anything to hide. I'm pretty hardcore conservative Republican. Um, and if you're not that way, you'll still have to love me. Everybody smile. <laughs> but at no point, listen to me carefully, at no point should we ever use the New Testament floor mat to preach a political agenda. Their salvation. Salvation in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone is far more important than your political party. It's far more important than a political agenda. And Jesus calls us to do that. However, very seldom within our culture is the church ever recognized as being a voice for good. May it be said, a freedom church... May it be said of its people that we are a voice for good instead of running people down. Christ calls us to build people up. Instead of being a voice of discouragement, God wants us to be a voice of encouragement. Let me share with us this morning five reasons why that God calls us to be a voice for good. Reason number one, God calls us to be a voice for the weak because they don't have a voice. Did you know that's what separates America from any other country? Is because that there are individuals who have the power to speak and have the leverage to change the people, the predicament of where people are at, all because of one voice, your voice. Your voice can make a difference. Reason number two, we need to be a voice for the weak because they are often overlooked and neglected. There are currently single women 
who are struggling to love their children, struggling to go from paycheck to paycheck, struggling to know how they're going to put clothes on their children and put food on the table and go from day to day to never know if anybody is out there to love them. They're single probably because of something that unfortunate beyond their level of control has happened. And these single women just want to know one thing. Is there anybody out there to love them? You know what the New Testament church is supposed to do? It's to love them. Embrace them. And say regardless of what you go through, we we don't want you to be overlooked. And we certainly don't want you to be neglected. But how easy it is. For us to get caught up in our everyday activities, how easy it is for us just to be going and going and pursuing and not even think about anyone else. God calls us not to overlook nor to neglect. The third reason is because that they are often taking advantage of. Is there a fly on my glasses? I got to tell you, that is really weird. How long were you guys going to let me preach? <laughs> let, me, let, let me just say this. Fly on your glasses is better than a fly in your mouth. <laughs> reason number three. We need to be a voice for the weak because reason number three, because they are often taken advantage of. For those who are not familiar, for those who do not know, The plight of the eastern Kentucky coal miners. That's a whole lot better today than what it was back then. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a condition called black lung. They would work these coal miners, these poor coal miners. They would come in. They were literally dirt poor. They had nothing. And they wanted to provide for their family. So they would bring in. And build these little huts for the coal miners to take care of their families. There's a story. There's a true story. It's a bluegrass song called Daddy Won't You Take Me Back to Muhlenberg County. I encourage you to go on YouTube and and listen just to the heart-wrenching story of how that the, the people in eastern Kentucky were taken advantage of while the rich and comfortable took advantage of those Individuals. Very often, the weak, the poor, and the suffering are taken advantage of. And that's why God calls us to be a voice for the weak. Fourthly, we need to be a voice for the weak because Jesus wants us to have a heart for people. Man, I just love, I just love the fact that Jesus was teaching to thousands of individuals. And while he is teaching, one of his disciples, one of his followers comes up and says, Hey, Jesus. Just in case you haven't noticed, these people have been here for a long time. And you're probably going to have to send them away because we don't want them to pass out on on their way home. Jesus said, that's an excellent idea. You feed them. Can I just say this? I, I I I want to say it with all the grace that I can. People are messy. Sometimes people are just downright mean and hateful. Sometimes people just act real ugly. Christ does not call you to look on the outside of people. Christ calls you to show grace and love to those people. Because if we do not have compassion for people... You need to fall on your knees and pray until God gives you compassion for people. And you will never, you'll never be able to have a voice for people until you have a heart for people. If your heart does not melt because that people are concerned and being a voice, let me tell you, One of the doctors that I work with just this past week was driving from Green Memorial and going to Soin. And as he is traveling, as he is traveling, he sees a little kid out by the road. Doesn't even know the kid. 
But he stops because this child's life is in danger. And the child is not able to comprehend that it's about ready to get run over out in the road. It does not even perceive the danger. And this doctor who's got a surgery that's scheduled and caught up in these activities, he stops right in front of the driveway right before the child can get out. How easy it is for people to have compassion when the kids are little. But when they start growing up and start having bad attitudes. Can I get an amen? Freedom Church needs to minister out of a heart of compassion. Freedom Church needs to pray for people out of a heart of compassion. Freedom Church needs to be able to embrace people with a heart of compassion. And then reason number five why God wants us to have a voice for the weak. Reason number five is because God cares for those people through us. One of the greatest biblical illustrations of this. Where a man's heart is literally crushed. For people is in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1. And let me just give you a real quick historical background. Nehemiah lives a life of comfort and ease. He is one of the chamberlains within the king's court. He serves directly under King Xerxes, and he's living in the palace. That means he's got a very nice, comfortable job. He wears nice, comfortable clothes. He eats good food. If I painted a picture, everybody say amen. But something strikingly changes his life because, you see, this is during the historical context of when the is Israelites, where they were, taken away into captivity into Babylon. And so Nehemiah wants to know, how is the remnant that's still back there, how are they doing? Listen to these words. Because Nehemiah asks, how are the people back in Jerusalem, how are they doing? They said unto me, things are not going well. For those who have returned to the province of Judah, they are in great trouble and disgrace the wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed with fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. May God give us so much brokenness for people. May God have permission to rob us of our sleep. May God allow literally tears to flow down our eyes. Because we have got so much compassion. When I was a young Christian going up in church, I would see people almost in every single service shed tears for lost people. That's almost been a thing of the past anymore. May God give us a brokenness for that. And that leads us to point number two. Point number two is love without reservation. The Bible tells us one of the most simplistic verses of all the Bible. It says, God is love. That is the essence of God. And that is the essence and the reason why God does everything that he does. He does everything based on his love. And God wants us to love. Not only does God want us to be a voice for good. But God wants us to love without reservation. Did you know that if you show partiality, if you show favoritism, that you are living contrary to God's word? And that's not always easy to do, folks. I'm not going to lie. God calls us to love without reservation. Within the scripture, one of the greatest one of the greatest stories can be told of a king who finally rose into a very prominent position. Used to be a shepherd boy, now he is a king over the whole nation. But several years ago, his best friend Jonathan had a son whose name was, was Mephibosheth. 
And when Mephibosheth was still just a young infant, the lady who was taking care of him, they received some absolutely horrific news and she got up and she started to run and she stumbled and she fell on the young child, Mephibosheth, and it broke both of his legs. And he was never able to recover. And he was lame. He, he was doomed as a cripple for the rest of his life. And so King David, when he comes into power and he wants to do something, he wants to use that power for good. He wants to use the leverage that he has for something good. He says, is there something that I can do to show and extend grace to Jonathan's household? They said, yes, there is an individual who lives in Lodabar. His name is Mephibosheth. And David says, go and fetch him and bring him here. Can you imagine being Mephibosheth? You're at home. You can't fend for yourself because you can't get around. There's very little that you can do. And you have very little hope that your life will ever get better because you've been that way for quite a while. And then all of a sudden, somebody knocks on your door and opens it up. They've come to your little community called Lodabar. They open the door and they said, Mephibosheth, the king has requested you to come into his presence. That's pretty serious because the king just didn't do that for everybody. And so he's probably thinking, and he even says it. He's, he calls himself a dead dog because he thinks that the king is going to execute him. And they bring him before the very presence and he falls down and he's, he's so humble. He's so afraid of what is about to transpire. But King David does something that literally transforms his life forever. He said, no, Mephibosheth, I've not called you in to kill you or to punish you. I have called you in and to let you know that from here on out, you're going to get to eat from the king's table. Is that not a picture of grace? Is that not a picture of undeserved grace? Because as we stood before the king, we were crippled. We had nothing to offer. We had no way of making ourselves better. But the king says, I love you anyway. That's loving without reservation. And point number three this morning, provide support and comfort. Provide support and comfort. God calls us to be a voice for good. God calls us to show love without reservation. God calls us to provide support and comfort. Let's take a look at what God expects us to do. First of all, rest assured that God hears your cries. Because I know for a fact that it is a part of a human nature. When we're stuck in a predicament and we cry and we pray and we pray and it doesn't seem like our prayers are going anywhere, we might even get frustrated. We might even question, does God even hear me? Does God even know? Rest assured that God not only sees, but God also hears our cries. In Exodus chapter 3, God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush. And he says, Moses, I want you to know something. I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Can I just encourage you that God, God sees your affliction or the afflictions of your loved ones? God sees that. And God may have spoke to your heart. This, God could deliver them out completely, totally by himself. But God uses people, everyday people like you and me, just like he's getting ready to use Moses. Moses, I've seen their cries. I've heard their prayers. I'm sending you to deliver them. Sometimes the form of somebody's prayer may mean that you are the answer. Secondly, comfort can come in the simple form of being friendly. How would it change your life when you woke up on Monday morning and you said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live my morning as instructed from the Scripture. I want to be a friendly person because you can provide a lot of ministry 
just about being friendly. Listen to God's word in Ruth chapter 2. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, for that you have comforted me, for you have spoken friendly unto me. You have the power to do that. You might, not, you might not have the power to heal somebody's wound. You might not have the power to cause all their situation to go away. But you certainly have the power to be a friend. And to show some friendship. Thirdly, there is tremendous comfort through fellowship. God calls you into fellowship. That is why it is so important that you make a high-level commitment to come to God's house every single Sunday. If you can't make it for Sunday, we have Saturday evening services. We also encourage individuals to come through small groups because that helps you to grow in your faith, gives you the opportunity to ask questions, to dive in deeper. But there is tremendous comfort through fellowship. And God thinks that this area is so important about finding comfort and support. God thinks it is the most important issue in your life. I want to read a scripture that supports that thought. God thinks that you finding comfort and support and you being comfort and support is the most important issue of the Christian walk. Listen to this. James chapter 1 verse 27. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans, those who can't care for themselves, and widows, those who can't care for themselves, in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Here's where the world will corrupt you. Because if you're not careful, you can get in the mindset that you don't have to do anything. You can just come to church, sit down, and that you can leave, and that there's no change between Monday and Saturday. That's where the world will corrupt us. Not smiling at somebody, not being friendly, not loving on people. And Jesus even takes this a bit further. Jesus reinforces this thought in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus talks about an individual who fell among thieves. I'm going to tell you what, folks. Listen to me very carefully. There is no way possible in this world that you're going to alleviate all the, all the things that happen bad in a person's life. I'm just, being, I'm just being honest here. I'm going to keep it real. If you was to wipe away ISIS today, there'd be another radical group tomorrow. Somebody say amen. amen. You are not going to, you're not going to protect someone from all the disastrous things that can happen in this world, but you can certainly provide support and comfort. Say amen. And Jesus talked about this man through no fault of his own. He fe- the Bible says he fell among thieves. He didn't deserve it. He wasn't a great sinner. This wasn't part of punishment upon him. This is just the way that life is. And the Bible says once they took all that he had, they left him for dead. And here's the sad part about this. Jesus said there were two religious leaders that just passed by. Didn't do anything for him. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Sounds like a tremendous story. And we could all say, man, that is awesome. That is incredible. But it doesn't stop there. Because Jesus looks at the face of the, of the people that he's talking to. And he says, I want you to go and do thou likewise. Man, we want to be followers of Jesus Christ. We want to follow him. If you want to have integrity in your life, you want to do what God calls us to do. Be a voice for good. 
to love without reservation, to be comfort and support. We're going to ask Nathan to come. I'm going to ask everyone, if you would, just real quickly, bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We say thank you for allowing us to come. We say thank you for allowing us to find comfort and support and love and grace and forgiveness in you. But God, sometimes people, they're just hurting. Sometimes people are suffering. Sometimes people go through loneliness. Sometimes people go through heartaches and hurts. And God, we don't want those people to go through life alone. We don't want those individuals to have to suffer and just to go through alone. God, may we be the hands that touch them. May we be the arms that embrace them. May our lips be the lips that speaks words of hope and life into their hearts. May we be your people. May we be a people of integrity. And may we stand up for the weak. Give us the courage to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.